so here we were in Italy in this little villa in the middle of nowhere. And we had talked about this before. We'd had these three miscarriages. Uh, every time you have a miscarriage, it gets a little bit harder to decide to try again because it's just emotionally gut-wrenching to go through that experience. Uh, but we did, and I think that says a lot about the fact that we wanted a child and we're really committed to this idea. Um, as we were going to bed the night that we got the results, I turned to my husband and I said, you know, it's, it has to be true that every conversation is safe for us about this. And so I feel like we need to ask ourselves, are we continuing with this pregnancy? And Eric said, yes. And I said, yes. And that was that. I imagine that for a lot of families, there's a whole lot more involved. There, you hear a lot from moms who say that they knew when they were like eight that they wanted to be moms. I, that wasn't that girl. Um, especially like when you spend your 30s as a single woman, you kind of start to just assume that maybe that's not going to be for me. I met Eric and started dating him when I think I was 35, and we got married when I was 38. And um, pretty quickly it became apparent to us that we wanted to have kids. So we started trying right away. It was a simple blood draw. They look for the DNA of the fetus inside the mom's blood. And they can tell you with a very high degree of certainty the chances of your child having Down syndrome. Uh, how did it feel to get that diagnosis? And um, that was, I would say, the closest thing to a moment of terror that I can think of. E even at 10 weeks, I was in love with this human that was growing inside me. And when you're in love with someone, the last thing that you want to hear is that they're going to struggle or that they're going to have a problem, um, an uphill battle, that they're, that they're going to get sick or that life will be hard. And that was what someone was telling me. And I was in this beautiful area with nothing but free time and nothing but open space. And I felt suffocated by fear, by grief, by worry. It, this is the reason why uh, genetic testing, especially so early in pregnancy, is a gift or was a gift to us. And that's that we had the opportunity in those really early weeks to do all of that grieving and to find our support and to learn what we needed to learn and to come to terms with it and to experience that whole grieving process and reach a period of commitment and joy and knowledge long before my son was born and I was first holding him. And it made the moment that they put him into my arms a moment of pure joy. And that's what every mom deserves. Our doctor encouraged us to go to a genetic counselor and at first we said no thanks. And he kept pushing it and kept pushing it and eventually we capitulated and decided to go. And I have an email uh, that I looked up, that I sent to my brother the day before I went that said, I'm going to talk to a genetic counselor tomorrow. I have no idea why. I was headed in there. The, I pulled into the driveway not knowing why I was seeing this genetic counselor. It became pretty clear as we got in there that their job was to explain the mechanics of Down syndrome to us, to draw out um, what trisomy meant and to explain how it happens that an extra chromosome finds its way into the genetic code of, of a child. Um, we learned the differences between mosaic Down syndrome and what I call typical Down syndrome. We learned the difference between translocation and, and, and other forms um, and had a chance to ask our questions. And they handed us a book uh, that was a, a new parent's guide to Down syndrome. I've come to understand since that the, the role of the genetic counselor can also be one of emotional support in helping parents deal with the diagnosis. For any parents who are grappling with this, who need to be educated on what Down syndrome is and how it happens. And, uh, you know, we have parents in our network who are even grappling with the idea that somehow this is their fault. And to have the burden of that false myth uh, off of their shoulders is a really powerful gift. So um, I think it's a fabulous that that resource is available and that it's encouraged for all parents who are going through that experience. There are, there are absolutely physicians who are excellent at delivering neutral diagnoses and not pushing the abortion option. But unfortunately, if you listen to the stories of mothers I know across the country who have kids under three, including some who are pregnant now and just got their diagnosis three weeks ago, they're feeling pressure at the moment that they're receiving this test result. And I know a lot of physicians who might feel like they're not biased and that they're doing, or that they're doing the right thing by delivering a diagnosis beginning with the words, I'm very sorry, I have bad news. And even that is a subtle form of bias because 
when you say that, you're handing us a frame through which to experience the news you're about to tell us. And the frame that you've handed us says, what I'm about to tell you is a bad thing, right? But the biases, unfortunately, aren't always so subtle. And, um, you know, even to the point where the very next sentence out of their mouth after the diagnosis is, you have options including termination, let's talk about that. Rather than, what questions do you have? I'm here for you. We can talk about all of your options. Where would you like to go from here? You grieve the child and the parenting experience you're not going to have. That grief eventually makes way for the reality of what you really are going to experience and the child that you will have, which are nowhere like at all those things that you imagine. They're nowhere near as negative and they're so much more packed with joy. Um, but you don't know that in that first moment. <laughs> to say nothing of the fact that the kid is just so fun to be around. <laughs> he is so fun to be around. He is funny, he's social, he's observant, he's capable. And, um, and it's a lot more like having any other kid than you would ever imagine. Um, he's discovering the world at two and a half, and he's discovering how his body interacts with that world. And um, watching that is just is so much fun. And, uh, and he is just a gregarious, social little kid. So here's the new baby. She's a little bit wrinkled. <laughs> she was in mommy's backpack for a while. It got kind of crumpled up, but... Uh... There she is. Well, you've had three miscarriages. It's a thrill just to see a heartbeat when you go in for your first ultrasound. I told my doctor at this, at this ultrasound that it was a little bit disorienting to be at 12 and a half weeks and have her just keep saying things like, looks great, looks great, looks great, looks great, everything looks normal, uh, because it's just not been my experience ever as a, a mom who's been pregnant four times. So uh, yeah, it's really fun. And you know, like I said before, I'm starting to feel those little butterfly tumbles of him or her moving around, and that's pretty exciting. I'm dying to know the gender. In the end, my husband and I tend to believe that we're here in the world to say yes to experiences. And that was really it. It was, it was the real, realization that um, as much joy as Drew has brought to our lives, another kid would multiply that in spades. And you know, also just a realization that we both grew up with siblings and we really wanted Drew to as well. Um, we have a little baby doll that Drew plays with and he gives it kisses and he cuddles it. And he has a book where every time he sees the new baby, he signs for baby. Um, he also throws the baby over the back of the couch and tries to rip its arms off. But, you know, we're okay. Um, it, it gives us enough to just imagine the joy that that's going to bring to our family. Oh, oh. <laughs>